Well, we find ourselves today, part three of our sermon series, Powerful Promises to Promote Pride. I tend to like those plosive P things, don't I? And I want to start by sharing with you a contemporary parable called Homosexuality in Christianity. And Jesus said to them, once there was a country, an evangelical social justice organization, and a Protestant denomination, the country considered passing a law allowing people to be put to death or imprisoned because they loved people of the same gender. The social justice organization refused to run an advertisement supporting full inclusion in churches for same gender loving people. The denomination, after struggling long with the issue, changed its bylaws so that same gender loving people could be ordained as clergy. As long as they were of high morality and character and loved God and neighbor. Now I ask you, said Jesus, which of these three were enacting the kingdom or the realm of God? But one disciple said, well, it was the country that was so eager to follow the letter of God's law as outlined in Leviticus. And Jesus said, the kingdom is a realm of life, not death, of love, not hatred, of binding up the broken, not breaking down the despised. No, the country was not enacting the kingdom of God. And the disciples muttered among themselves and fell silent. And another disciple said, I, I think it was the social justice organization, since it was acting on its principles and refusing to condone gay marriage. And Jesus said, what does welcoming a lesbian couple and their son into church have to do with marriage? Having eyes, do you not see? And they were confused and muttered among themselves again. And he said, when we meet together, who has been at our table? Has it not been the poor and despised? Have they not been welcome among us? Who have we excluded from our table? In many instances, he said, the organization was enacting the kingdom of God, but not so this time. And the disciples grumbled further. Then another disciple said, Rabbi, is it the Protestant denomination since they decided to ordain those who followed well the great commandment and the second commandment that was like it? And Jesus smiled and said, you have spoken correctly. Then all the disciples fell silent and he said to them, be like this denomination. Welcome everyone. Help all to grow in love and faith, and draw your leaders from those who have the strongest love and the strongest faith, so that they may help others grow. Then he withdrew to pray. And I would add, may metropolitan community churches always be that denomination. Amen? Amen. Pride in our community has come to mean lots of things, but Today I want to talk about it having to do with not just accepting, but celebrating yourselves as queer folk. Being good in your own skin, wherever you find yourself. I think pride connotes the embracing of ourselves and one another, just as we are, with the hope and expectation that God will continue the transformation process. But as our self-confidence and pride as the community has emerged, I need to tell you I've had to upgrade or update my language. Maybe it's happened to you too. I remember the time when as a people I just wanted other people to acknowledge us. We exist, okay? Remember the old chant, 
You know, we're queer, we're here, get used to it. <laughs> Acknowledgement. And then I think we moved into a time when we wanted tolerance. I remember, and I still find myself wearing occasionally the Promote Tolerance pin. Tolerance. You know, you tolerate a headache or toothache till you can do something about it, right? So we moved into, okay, just put up with us, all right? And then I think we wanted acceptance, which is tolerance, but not quite so grudging. Well, that's not good enough anymore. I want to be embraced and celebrated, don't you? And I think yeah. we have every right to be celebrated and embraced as a people, amen? Yeah. But I have to tell you, pride doesn't just happen. It's hard work to overcome the profound impact of abusive religion and cultural abandonment that has turned us into the other, those people, kind of the scapegoat for society, the despised minority that the last couple of generations have, in many instances, successfully made in us. Last time we said that too many of our people have spent far too long living out what some sociologists call sane schizophrenia, living two lives, the real one and the one we used to put on display, pretending we aren't who we are, changing the pronouns and significant people in our lives and conversations and situations where we just intuitively knew we'd be ostracized if the real truth of our lives was made known. I remember carefully editing conversations when anything personal might come out that would give me away. And I can tell you I became a master at steering conversations in extended family gatherings when the inevitable question would come up, are you seeing anyone special? <laughs> and many of us lived lives of desperation and isolation and oppression. And all of that homophobia, the hatred and fear, is rooted in all places. Can you imagine in the Christian church? In that church that's supposed to extend living waters to whosoever will. That church that was founded by the Son of the Almighty who said, I know your frame. I created you. I know you are, as the little kid asked his mom when the pastor talked about, what is butt dust? <laughs> God remembers we're butt dust. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We'll slow the uptake this morning. <laughs> or maybe it was the delivery. <laughs> and all of that connected to a handful of poorly translated and or wrongly interpreted verses. We pointed out also that no sooner had the wideness of God's mercy begun to spread then humans began to scramble around to rein it back in, arguing about who could and couldn't be saved, under what conditions, and even as God began taking down barriers, church leaders began scrambling around to erect them. Two weeks ago, we talked about Peter's speech at the Jerusalem Council in 50 AD. But I want to tell you something about Peter. He wasn't always open and affirming. Like many of us, he struggled just as the early church struggled and just as modern mainstream churches continue to grapple with the terms of our salvation. Those of you who were here for the game service several weeks ago will recall how Reverend Frank Schaefer described what was happening in the United Methodist Church as they continue to struggle on who's in and who's out. But for Peter, I think the opening up process started even before Acts when he was at Cornelius' home and 
the sheet came down. I used to think that was the starting point, but I was thinking about it a little more this week. And I really think it started in the third post-resurrection appearance of Jesus in John 21. If you happen to have a copy of Scripture, you want to turn there. In John 21, Jesus has a couple of his disciples with him, and he's just told Peter that he is going to die a martyr's death. Peter's response, not really to that, was rather to look or to glance back at John and to ask Jesus, well, what about him? Peter wasn't satisfied with God telling him what was going to happen in his life. He wanted to know about John's future as well. And Jesus answered in a particularly interesting way. He said, Peter, if I want him to remain alive until I come, what is that to you? Interesting question. What is that to you? Now, I learned that from Rick Warren, who credits his wife Kay with naming it the witty principle. W-I-T-T-Y. What is that to you? We get ourselves into trouble when we start comparing ourselves to other people. And when we do that, God says to us, what is that to you? God wants our focus not to be on others, to, but to be following Christ. Not worrying about people, what they're doing or not doing, it's not your business why other people are involved a little or a lot or doing certain ministries or not doing certain ministries. You need to be focused on what God has called you to do and leave the rest alone. Romans 9 last time reminded us that God will have mercy on whom God will have mercy and compassion on whom God will have compassion. That we are clay pots in the hands of the magnificent potter. And it takes us a while to get that. But it takes other people even longer than us because they can't somehow stand the fact that God not only created but revels and celebrates diversity. They suffer, I think, and I, I believe this is an original with me, what I like to call OSS. It's called the older son syndrome. One of my favorite stories that Jesus tells is in Luke 15. Maybe you know that story. This parent had two children, the younger of whom came and said, in the, in the story, it's dad, I'd like to have my inheritance right here, right now. And the father, being gracious, gave it to him. And he went off and he squandered it with riotous living. King James says. He blew it doing things that probably weren't quite as bad as his older brother thought, but nonetheless. And when the chips were down and the money was gone and he sort of had dropped bottom and was out there feeding the pigs, a terrible thing for a young Jewish boy to have to do, and began to look at the slop and be hungry for it because things were so bad in his life, he said, aha, you know what, even hired hands back on the homestead have it better than I do. I'm going to get myself up, go back. I'm going to repent and ask my parent if I can just be like a hired hand. And so that's what he does. And when he is coming back, it's interesting, the scripture says that his father saw him from afar off, which meant that the dad, who by the way never left the porch. Um, didn't go out looking for him, but was available when he came back home. Was watching and waiting and hoping. And when that young man returned, he ran to greet him and brought back all the symbols, all the symbols of restoration and redemption and welcomed him back home. And the older brother who's been home all the time doing what he's supposed to do, starts seething. We're talking seething. And he says, Dad, you never 
You know, I have been here all these years. You never brought out a fatted calf and made a big to do about me. And this one goes and blows all this money and does God knows what with God knows who. And he comes back and you throw a party. Wish he didn't know the witty principle, huh? <laughs> OSS, older son syndrome. I think that MCC is like the prodigal son. I think for a season, most of us could have cared less about the things of God, the homestead, the farm. Understand that MCC is only 45 and a half years old. We have mainline denominations that have been around for centuries, and we're only decades. And for a long time, and even still, those mainline denominations are like that older brother. They just can't stand it. The MCCs are growing and gaining ground. You can almost hear them say, God, why are you blessing those people? Why are you embracing them and inviting them and welcoming them at your table? They're like the older brother. They stay home, you know. They've served predict predictably. They've carefully maintained the Christian tradition of just being there with dad, plodding along, status quo. It was the younger sibling that found the long road back home. And he understood so well what it means not to take the parents' love and care for granted. An experience that doesn't even come up on the older siblings' screen. Now, among MCCs in the world, I just want to say, are those family and friends who have stood with us and supported us. And we say again, thank you. God bless you. Your love still sustains us. But there are those older sibling churches who are just seething. As they say, you know, how dare God bless their churches, prosper and use their movement to change and transform lives and laws and to bring about justice in a broader way around the world and even the United States than most of us would have dreamed in our lifetime. Just this past week, I've been keeping tabs. Two steps forward, one step back. Wednesday, this past Wednesday night, the city of Pembroke Pines, 10th largest city in Florida, added domestic partner benefits for their employees. Now that is the 27th local policy victory we've won in Florida in the last 18 years. I mean, it's not magic, it is hard work. It takes lots of people extending themselves. So if you can, show up Tuesday morning. And then in Washington, on Friday, U.S. Secretary of Labor Thomas Perez announced the proposed rule extending the protections of the Family and Medical Leave Act to eligible employees in the same-sex marriages regardless of where they live. But then, yeah. And then later on Friday, one of the largest booksellers in Spain launched the selling of a really dangerous book that teaches parents how to fix their gay children. The author of the book, who's an American doctor, was there to promote the launch. His goal is to help spread the gay cure globally, that dangerous reparative therapy treatment that has never worked and will never work. So let's pray that the sales plummet, amen? <laughs> but we don't give up and we don't give in. But the older sibling, see it was one thing for us to be in the bars and the baths and the bushes and the beaches <laughs> and parades. <laughs> It's quite another thing when we show up on Sunday morning 
in the light of day, without apology, and dare to do what God invites us to do, and that's boldly approach the throne of grace. Man. Don't you just want to say to the older sibling churches, it takes nothing away from you that God welcomes us prodigals back home. Don't you just want to say, quit fretting. There's enough grace and mercy to go around. It's not short supply. Because Peter and they will need to learn that if God wants to cast a wider net and extend salvation to all sorts of odd fish, that's God's prerogative. And just as Peter learned, what God has cleansed, no longer consider unholy. So God came to gather in and not to scatter, to lift up and not put down. God is not just about celebrating who you are, but about allowing God's healing touch to get to those layers of homophobia, rejection, fear, some of which we're not even aware that we have. Those Peter-esque tendencies in our lives that make us want to limit what God wants to extend. Pride is about committing ourselves even more deeply to the inclusivity and diversity that God has created and ensuring that the doors of the church are open wide, not just for us, but for the many, many people who still desperately need the life-changing message of MCC. Those who need to be reminded of what Jesus said in Matthew as he remembered the words of Isaiah. A tender picture of Jesus that I think is very precious. He said, a battered reed he will not break off, and a smoldering wick he will not put out. We have a lot of bruised reeds out there, and even in here, way down, bent over by trials and burdens and challenges, sometimes just of daily living, not even able to stand up erect anymore. And that dimly burning, that smoldering wick is just hardly able to hang on. I mean, one more big gust of wind, and it's gone. I want you to know that those are the ones that Jesus extends the welcome to. And part of our calling, I believe, is to make sure that every time we gather and every time we encounter those people in need, that we provide large doses, large doses, of hope and of help, which I believe really is the essence of what pride is about. Amen. Amen. Please rise as you're thinking.